<laughs> well, good evening, everybody. It's five o'clock Eastern Standard Time, or it is super bloody early in the afternoon if you're on the West Coast. It's Jeff from Home Renovation here, and we are here to do a live Q&A. So instead of just shooting off at the mouth and wasting a bunch of time and asking if the sound works and seeing who's in the chat and saying hello, hello, everyone, and let's move on. we got some questions to get to. We've got a couple of our members are already in the chat room tonight. Let's just say hi to the user house and existential paint. Great to have you guys join us tonight. Um, just so you all know, the way we run this live chat is really simple. Because we can't handle two and a half million people watching this show and asking questions, we limit the questions to members only. Or there is a super chat function so that if you want to get a question answered and you're not interested in being a member, you can basically... Um, I'm going to whore myself out. You can just tip me tonight and we'll answer your question. All right. So hit the super chat and I will help you out. Uh, our goal here with our whole channel guys really is to just, ah, man, it's like 1960. It's just free love. I'm going to share all my experience, right? And, and I want to help all of you navigate the world of renovations and remodeling. The world has gotten incredibly complex. We have a smaller labor force than ever. We have a huge population of homeowners. And people can't find contractors, so you're going to have to learn how to do stuff yourself. That's the bottom line. Or do without. You know, you got to choose. I personally believe that every homeowner is the best contractor they can have in their home. You care more than most, and everything you need to learn, you can learn right here. So, what the heck are you waiting for, right? Let's just get on with it. <laughs> wow, I got a huge TV off my camera here. You don't see it, but it's like three by six because I'm half one. And that's because I never wear safety glasses and all that kind of stuff. And that's fine. But um, listen, whatever you do for a living is going to kill you. This is my philosophy, right? And I'm not wrong, although it hasn't killed me yet. So until it does, I'm going to keep on sharing and answering questions and helping you guys out. We have such an awesome opportunity in our marketplace right now because houses have got crazy valuation. And I know everybody's doom and gloom. Oh, the bubble, this, the bubble. Screw the bubble. Listen. At the end of the day, the baby boomers retired. I get it. It sucks. You can't get a decent coffee in a decent amount of time anymore. There's no one working. The point is this. They're still living in their houses. They didn't leave. They're not put out to pasture yet. Okay? So there is still a huge pressure on the housing market. Although the prices aren't going to go up, they might have plateaued out just a little bit. They might have leveled off a little bit. Real estate is really regional. Okay? So depending where you are, you could have different experiences. I don't want to get into too much of that chat tonight. But the point is this. Because over the last few years, we've had such a huge growth in the value of homes. Now, more than ever, doing things yourself, DIYing it, makes incredible financial sense. Three years ago, if you wanted to do 400 square foot deck, a deck company would say, okay, we can do cedar. We'll do a great job. We'll give you a fire pit, some built-in chairs. Boom, boom, boom. Privacy screens, 25000 bucks. And that would have been expensive. And maybe you would have tried it yourself, but now they're going to quote you 35 or 40. Now you've got to do it yourself because it's less than 10,000 in material, which means, right, 80 cents on the dollar return investment for outdoor projects, mm -hmm, 36, you just made 26,000 bucks for a project you can do on one week off from work. Hello, show me a job that makes $26,000 a week. This is what we're talking about today, guys. We're talking about empowering you. Welcome to Money in the Bank TPS. Welcome, Chuck. Chuck joined the membership before the show even started tonight. Got to give a shout out to Chuck. And that was in the other live stream. That was in the other live stream. Chuck, if you aren't here yet, you're going to be here soon. Um, we are experimenting. We try to give notification out early tonight. And we have learned that we need to get some special software in order to do that. So the live stream tonight is not the live stream that was advertised, but it's the one that's here. And we're here. So I'm sure everybody will figure it out soon enough. Okay. Uh all right. Listen, uh, if we have some questions, Eric, let's just jump right into it. I don't have anything prepared tonight because I wanted to give you all the two hours, guys, because like time is money and I am willing to give it all to you. So um, there was one question here. This is her. Yeah. If luxury vinyl plank comes with underpad, do you recommend using proper underpad? Here's the thing. 90% of the luxury vinyl plank on the market that has an underpad attached is garbage underpad. Okay. They're, they're selling you a piece of thin crap to say, ooh, it has underpad. You're smart enough to ask the question because it doesn't look very thick, right? What's it going to do for you? Not a hell of a lot, 
right? It's like wearing a t-shirt instead of a bulletproof vest, right? It's there, but it's not there. It's just not going to perform. So yes, if you want to buy that LVP with the attached underpad, you're still going to need something for sound control. You're still going to want it, or it's going to sound like a fake floor end of the day. So find a product that doesn't have it or has a good underpad, something like a thick cork, like you get from floor and decor down the south. Um, Torley's Floor in Canada has a great quality cork underlay. A lot of this um, EVA underlay that comes attached as a pad, they call it the pad. It's like half a millimeter. It doesn't even exist. It's just, it's barely there. It's almost painted on. It's not performing for you. So, wow, we have members jumping in from all over the place. Welcome, Matus. Welcome, James. Welcome, Siggy. All right, guys, this is awesome. Uh, let's get into some questions here. Wendy says she's first time here, long time watcher. Well, thanks, Wendy. I'm glad. <laughs> and here we are. Okay, Sean has a question. Is there a real quality difference between tiles at Home Depot versus a tile store? Do I need to even answer the read the rest of that question, Eric? I see stuff I like at Home Depot for a buck fifty to two fifty tile. Tile stores seem to be ten to twenty dollars in Ontario. All right, here's the deal. When you look at a tile, you're looking at a picture put on to some sort of backing, whether it's ceramic or porcelain, or whatever. There are a lot of different qualities in the backing. You might find a picture that you like because Home Depot is really good at serving up what's trendy in the picture on a piece of crap Indonesian ceramic. All right. And I'm no offense to Indonesia. They make some of the greatest cheap tile in the world. The point is, yes, there's a huge difference between a, a Indonesian ceramic versus a rectified porcelain. And the difference is this. If you do your whole kitchen in an Indonesian ceramic, and you drop a pot, guess what you have to do? Buy a brand new floor because you can't find that stone anymore because it's discontinued three weeks after it's on the shelf. If you put a rectified porcelain in there, you could drive a Sherman tank over your kitchen floor and be just fine. You get what you pay for when it comes to tile, okay? If you find something cheap, you're buying cheap. If you find something expensive, you're buying quality. End of discussion. Now, if you don't know who the store is or they just pop open one day, you know, maybe there's room to argue, well, he's just overcharging. The point is this. Ceramic is the cheapest. There's good and bad ceramic. Then there's porcelain. Then there's rectified porcelain. And then there's natural stone. So don't be surprised if the picture that you like on the surface looks really pretty, but it's not a good quality stone. All right. Next question. East Memorial Baptist Church. The entire church is now a member of our channel. How about that? That is pretty cool. Um, next question, Eric. Hook me up. There you go, Melly Mel. Melly Mel wants to know what to do when the top layer of wallpaper does not come off. Ooh. Yes, there are a few stinkers out there. All right, Mel. I want you to go to your local paint store. They're going to sell you a little round thing with a bunch of teeth on a wheel. And you're going to score your wallpaper. And you're puncturing the wallpaper. And they're going to also sell you a product probably from a company called Dynamic. And you're going to put that on the wallpaper and it's going to penetrate all those holes and it's going to loosen up the adhesive that's in behind. There are some vinyl wallpapers out there that are not two ply. It's just single. And you've got to get in behind it. Okay. So if that's you and you've watched my video and that process didn't work, it's because you're dealing with vinyl. All right. It's kind of like flooring on the wall with glue. It's disgusting. It's a pain in the butt. Um, sometimes it's easier just to put brand new drywall on than take that stuff off. But if you want to give that score wheel a try, you're going to have to do a skim coat when you're done because the drywall will be punctured and perforated, but it will work. Okay. So give that a try. All right. Next question. Rapid fire. Manny Guillerme. I hope I said that right. I'm going to try. I want to stretch myself. Okay. Is Laticrete's Hydroband liquid waterproofing as good or better than the sheet membrane like Schluter? Uh, that's a brilliant question. Okay. So, Laticrete, Hydroban, um, Redguard, uh, Eco Prime Grip, and and um, the Mape products. There's a bunch of different companies out there that have roll-on membranes. If your substrate is solid, and it's and the corners are taped and secured, and everything is installed properly, and then you put on the proper membrane, you do the right thickness, and you get everything perfect. I think that's a better system than the Schluter membrane system. Mm. However. 
to be 100% correct at anything is very difficult in a home res remodel, okay? So where Schluter is really spectacular is as long as you install your Schluter products and you don't have wrinkles in your inside corners and in your joints, it is incredibly resistant to the moisture because there's two pieces of plastic which are hydrophobic and they repel water, all right? If you don't do a good job with your membrane, it's not thick enough to withstand expansion contraction. It can crack behind the tile over time and then you can fail. End of the day, whatever you put in your house for a shower waterproofing system, the more money you invest in the technology, the better result you get. The more care and attention to the minor details you put, the better result you're going to get. Schluter is an amazing product if you install it properly. And can I just say for the best results with any Schluter product in a shower, use in-floor heating. If you add a drying component to your waterproofing system, you will never be disappointed, okay? One of the biggest challenges with Schluter is, in my experience, and this is not a not something Schluter says, it's just my experience, a lot of people use the cheapest thin sets possible to apply their product. And there is a huge difference, even in thin set, to the kind of performance you get out of it, and, and it complements the Schluter system. So if you're going to go with Schluter and you want to have the peace of mind that things are going to go well, don't be afraid to use their thin set. Use their most expensive thin set they have. Because the advanced technology in thin set, some of it just bonds, it sticks to it, and some of it crystallizes, like it like grows into your skin and grabs a hold of your bones, kind of like that's really good thin set. So there's a different levels of application for even the same product. And most people don't even talk about thin set like there can be good and bad thin set, but there is. You can buy it for 15 or you can buy it for 80 bucks a bag. You can buy additives. <sighs> At the end of the day, find out, you know, like what's your price point? Where, where, where does it hurt? And then go there because that's going to be where your peace of mind is. All right. If you're doing projects yourself, guys, don't cheap out on the process. Okay. You're already getting three to four times your money return and investment. So don't cheap out. Like go all in. Right. Like you're not going to go to. You're not going to go to the World Series if you don't buy a good pitcher, right? You just can't do it. I don't care how good your infield is. The whole system's got to be amazing. So if you want to win, spend the money because you win already by DIYing it. Matus, making a shed next to the home. Requirement is firewall with gypsum board. Okay. Where do I install it? <laughs> Inside, between the structures. There will be maybe one in space. Okay. Yeah, that's an interesting question. So, uh, if I knew, guys, when you're asking questions and you're talking about code specifically, tell me where you live, right? I need to know your geography, your, your thermal zone, that kind of stuff. Matus, here's the thing. Structures have fire code. They don't want fire to spread from one structure to the next, okay? So, generally speaking, in a shed, fire would start inside a shed. So what they're asking for in your code is for you to have drywall inside the shed that gives you a 20 minute fire protection, right? That's all. It would be ideal if outside your house, the siding was fire resistant. If you're using like a hardy board or um, a brand new siding that's got a, a composite product that doesn't catch fire, all right? But generally speaking, the code is gonna say if you're gonna put something too close to the house and depending where you live, it could be two feet, it could be four feet, it could be six feet, they're going to want to make sure that that shed, if it catches fire, is going to have response time for the fire department to show up before it affects your residence. That's really what they're looking for. So you might have to put some drywall in there, okay? And that's what they're asking for. Cheers. You got to come back. Yeah, back. sure. Uh, for pressure-treated deck, Derek has a question, and splitting occurs. Is it best to sand it or epoxy glue it or neither? If you have a pressure-treated deck and you're getting splitting, it's because it's exposed to a lot of sun and it doesn't have UV protection, okay? That's really the secret. You need to moisturize, just like skin, all right? If your deck doesn't have any moisture, it can dry out to the point where it just shatters. So consider this. Splitting deck means you need moisture, all right? Maybe you live in an area where it doesn't get enough rain for a few months a year. Get a coat of UV protection on there. Go visit our friends over at C2. All right, on the website, c2.com, and buy some C2 Guard. 
right? It comes in, has UV protection in it. It is a penetrating sealer. So it moisturizes the wood, helps it to swell up and expand and relax. And it gives you UV protection, okay? And as long as the water is beating on the surface, you're fine. It stops beating, throw another coat on. You don't have to do any sanding or prep or nothing. Just throw another coat on. The stuff is amazing. Split wood still works. It's like having two one by threes instead of one one by six, right? It's not gonna be the end of the world. It's the thickness of the wood that transfers the load. So you should be just fine to avoid splitting, keep it moisturized. Now, TPS with peel and stick left by previous owners. Peel and stick floor tile, I'm assuming we also wanna take out all the carpet, live with concrete as we save up, seal the concrete. Yes, definitely do a concrete sealer. Um, guys, if you're not aware, paint companies, Sherwin-Williams, PPGs, the Duluxes, um, a lot of these companies that are around town, they'll have a commercial store in every region, which means they'll, have, they'll sell commercial product. Things that you will only use in industrial applications or big business, okay? And they have some of the most amazing masonry sealers that are clear coat that are on the market. So if you're going to live on a slab on grade and you're going to do a demo and then you're going to live there for a while, Buy one of those sealers because then it won't kick up any dust. It'll be easy to clean and you can even wash your floor, okay? Because it will, won't absorb any water. It's amazing. Uh, it's amazing what a few bucks can do, but definitely seal it up. Okay. Wow. Ba, 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 ba. The Sandman. How do you match textures when the bottom half of a room is wallpaper that you've removed and the top half is textured with sand in the orange peel? Well, the only way to match a texture is to resurface the entire wall. Unforge. You're going to have a hell of a time trying to match an existing texture that's sand in orange peel because there are so many variable settings on the tools used to put that orange peel on. The air pressure, the type of system, the volume of the pressure, how much water was put in the mix, um, the temperature, the humidity of the air, all these factors affect the finish, okay? So when you're going to go and try to match or blend a finish, especially when you're dealing with half a wall, write it off, okay? Skim coat the whole thing, get a three or four foot mud trowel, skim coat it and start over and spray a brand new texture on top. Save yourself the aggravation. You're going to go nuts. All right. Hey, cheers, Melanie. Welcome back. Um, she's just saying hi. Thank you. Melanie's been a member of our channel, I think, for like nine years. And we've only been on YouTube for six, which is kind of cool. All right. <clears throat> James has got a question here about finishing his basement. He's using dry core insole armor tiles. Okay. Has everybody heard about this? We haven't done a video yet. Uh, they got a brand new panel. It's no OSB. It's just the foam. It's super lightweight. They're smaller panels. It's easy to transport up and down the stairs in your cars. Great DIY. If you have an existing basement with walls and you find it cold, you can take the bottom two or three inches of drywall off the wall, put in the, this new dry core insole armor. It's like a big piece of hard foam. Put a floating floor right on top. Okay. It's awesome. But can I get back up to that question? <laughs> Sorry, I didn't even read the question. I'm, I'm just like, yeah, great. Let's talk about this product because I think it's awesome. Oh, it's further down. Further down. Um, boom. Yeah, there. Okay. So... <laughs> So you're going LVP on top. Okay, makes sense. Seems hard to level, even using the dry core plastic levels. Can I just use construction adhesive? So you're having issues leveling the foam. Mm. Wow, interesting. Okay, so if you have a rectangular panel and you have a bowl in the floor, you're going to have lippage, right? Makes sense? So... The, the foam is only good to the degree that the substructure or the concrete floor is good. And with all vinyl flooring, you're going to find that there's variations you can have up to a quarter inch over every six feet or eight feet, or depending on the manufacturer, the width of the board and all this kind of junk. Same with the foam. Foam isn't going to solve your bowl problem. It's only going to solve your thermal problem. If your foam isn't sitting nice, okay, try using a Tapcon with a washer to pull it nice and tight, to take the raised edge and drive it down to make it flush. Then you can go with your LVP on top. You're still gonna wanna use some sort of an underlayment because now you're adding screws to the surface and you don't wanna get that clicking noise, but that should work. Construction adhesive, all that's gonna do is, 
you're going to set it and then it's just going to pop out anyway because you got to have you got to have downward pressure to pull that foam tight now you can put a little construction adhesive and then use the screw that's probably your best plan i would use a pl200 because that bonds to the foam and the concrete all right and that'll work out well for you okay where are we right here. bradley okay i'm back good with a 1983 mobile home in South Carolina. Love it. Got the house wrap. Okay, going with James Hardy siding. Ooh, very nice. Should I house wrap over existing T11 and Hardy over? Ooh. Okay, so the question here really is T11 siding. Can it be used as a substrate to add siding? And the answer, yes. It's basically a three-quarter inch plywood, which means you can install anything over top of that thing all right you don't have to tear it all off it's a great substructure so why wouldn't move it as long as you've got enough overhang in your soffit and you can finish it and be pretty and your windows and everything and you can flash it and you're going to be happy with the finished product go right ahead it's basically three quarter inch plywood so knock your socks off dude we got some more members joining we aren't even down there yet we got some questions to answer. My God, we're going to go rapid fire here for a little while. We got a lot of work. We go. Hello, okay. Cool Josh. Hello, cool Josh. Great name, by the way. That is a great name. Yeah, I got to be. I got to be honest, Eric. That's a great name. I have bumps and waves under my Curdy and Dietra. Hmm. I didn't see any bump higher than one sixteenth. Should I rip everything apart? I want to use twelve by twenty four tiles on wall and floors. Okay. So, Curdy membrane and Dietra bumps and waves. I think we're coming right back to, do you have the right cement? Hello, Cool Josh. Remember, when you're using Curdy Membrane and Dietra, you've got to have the right mix of modified and non-modified in the right timing. So I don't know if you have access to the, the, the Schluter materials, the data sheet, the recommendations. Double check that the product you use is applicable. And then you can consider the advice I gave earlier about there's good and bad cement. If you have bumps and waves, it's because of the installation process. Sometimes it just doesn't bond well. Some cements just don't have good grab, okay? And so it's nasty. And those bumps and waves can lead to water damage. If it's not a steam shower, as long as you overlap the top part of the curtain over the bottom, if you have a little wrinkle, who cares? Okay, water goes downhill. It should be fine. Anything that makes you nervous about a bump and a wrinkle, you can get Curdy Fix or um, Loctite Sealant Bond or Lepage Sealant Bond up here in Canada. And you can use that, that caulking to close up the gap in the wrinkle so that water can't penetrate through that. Okay, you can seal it after the fact. And that'll allow you to maintain the product that you installed because you've already spent a lot of time and money on it. If you're going to go with a huge tile like a 12 by 24, that means you're going to be using like at least a 3 8 maybe even a half inch thick cement trowel roof. So you're going to be off the wall enough. I would consider sealing up your gaps in your wrinkles and then just move forward. Okay. You can salvage that project. It'll cost you 20 bucks for a good tube of that caulking, but it's worth it. Money in the bank. All right. Um, Darwin, <laughs> Florida, eight year. Am, am I reading that right? Yeah. I wanted to follow up on those windows in my bathroom. Okay. You said we were worried about the moisture intrusion on, and that's where the billing part is flashing. The answer is no. Okay. So here's the deal. Darwin sent me a member and the question, the members form. Show me a picture of his wall. It's a, it's a block wall and he's got a window and the stone underneath the window is dark gray, which means it's wet. And so he's got a problem where the water is getting in behind the window at the top of the window, traveling around the window and then sitting in his masonry. If the builder didn't put any flashing in, Darwin, get out there. You can get a little red tool for your vinyl siding. You can peel it open, lift it up, and tape it up there. Add the flashing. Tape that flashing to your house wrap. And then put your siding back, okay? And that will divert all of the water from going around the window and getting into the house. And that is going to be the solution to your problem. All right? Yeah. Caulking on the windows is only so good. Remember, if you have siding on your house, folks, in the wind, it moves around. And the water drives right in behind it. Okay? So if you don't have flashing, there's water literally coming down the wall, and it'll hit the top of the window, and it'll go in both directions, in and out. Okay, so half the water goes into the wall, half goes out. 
without a flashing to, to direct it all out, you are getting half the water into your house. There's just no way around it. Caulking can't solve that because you're caulking the surface, but the water's coming from behind the siding. All right. Okay. Um, the Inzer House has a four foot block wall put in the 50s in front of a 150 year old stone wall, Pittsburgh. Wow. We poles drain water constantly. Can I put a concrete slope in front to drain that water to a French drain in front? Um, yes. As long as the weep holes are working and the water is coming out of them, there's nothing wrong with putting a concrete slope in front of those to direct it to a French drain. As long as gravity is your friend and it's all moving in the right direction, don't even worry about it. Um, the thing about concrete in Pittsburgh is you do get winter. So you might want to dig down enough that you can put a, a piece of rigid foam underneath where your concrete pour is going to be just so that you aren't going to get heaving and frost and lifting up out of the ground and causing you an interruption with something that may or may not be visibly something you are watching on a regular basis. You don't be trapping water in that region, okay? Because if you trap water in a region and you get freeze thaw cycle in the wintertime, then you can start getting too much moisture in the brick wall and then you get heaving and then it's just a nightmare, right? So make sure you insulate underneath any concrete on an exterior like that where you're dealing with water diversion because... Pittsburgh, I know it gets winter, but it's not that wintry. It's not like Ottawa, right? So you're going to get a lot of freeze thaw cycle, and you can run into problems. Okay. Um, the water's pooling at the bottom otherwise and possibly undermining the wall. Yeah, Yinzer, gravity is your problem. So you really got to just stop worrying about the wall and deal with your, your flashing on the window, and all your problems are solved right there, okay? It's a four-foot piece of aluminum and a nine-cent piece of tape and a $9 tool to open up your siding and fix it. Trust me, it's gonna it's gonna be the end of the problem. Okay, TPS. Just up here. Mm. My contractor dad says adhesive and peel and stick doesn't need sealer. But our bare concrete idea does not need, does need sealer. Will sealing the concrete mess up tiling later? Okay, good, good question, uh, no. The product I'm talking about is a penetrating sealer. So if this is the concrete, it soaks up in underneath, okay? And it, and it fills up all those voids so that water can't absorb into the concrete. When you uh, are tiling later, you're gonna be using a thin set. Because it's sealed, the only place that the thin set can dry is into the atmosphere. So you treat it like as if it's a curdy membrane and you go with a non-modified cement in that application because you know. Now, if it takes a couple years before you get to the tile application, before you tile, Pour some water on the floor. If it beads up, use non-modified. If it doesn't bead up, it means it's worn out and it's absorbing moisture. Use the regular modified thin set at that point, okay? So if it can only dry to the atmosphere, use the non-modified. If it can dry into the stone, then use the modified. Okay. <laughs> All right. Oh. So everybody's saying the sound is good. Was there a question about no, the sound? I just, I just asked. You just asked? You just want to make sure? I yeah. appreciate that. I said, I got a live studio audience here tonight. Yeah. I've got Eric and Christina. We don't have a clap track, so we can't fake it. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> okay. Dennis has got a question. Have you considered doing a series on lead upgrades? Oh, God. No, I don't care. I'll be honest with you. <laughs> Can I just be honest? Um, there are people in this world that care about um, climate change and saving the planet through construction technology and new building systems. And that's what LEED is. I'm not one of them. I'm the guy that gives a rip about where you're living now and helping you to increase the performance of your house where you are. We're never going to get a residential house built in 1880 to be a LEED certified home. So I'm just not even going to care. The amount of money that I've seen people spend to try to save 10 cents a month on an energy bill is astronomical. It's insane. Everybody in the lead world just needs to give their head a shake and, and, and give the money to well digging in Africa because they're going to do a lot more good in the planet than doing that than lead. Anyway, moving on. Holy crap. We got half a billion people in, in, in North America living in a house built, you know, like before 1980. And we're worried about new commercial structures being so energy efficient. Like if you flush a toilet, the water's clean and you wash your hands with the same stuff. I don't care. Like God, move on. Next, Wendy, 1980s home in South Florida. 
ran plumbing from her house to a garage apartment. And I'm not saying there's no room for it, right? Like technology advances great, but do it in the shed, man. Like keep all that stuff to yourself until you can make it affordable for everybody. Like why we really care anyway. Oh, ran plumbing from a house to a garage apartment. Okay, hot water from shower barely gets warm. Big surprise. Uh, it's way the hell out there, but kitchen sink seems okay. What did we do wrong? Um, the, what you did wrong is you didn't put a source for hot water in the apartment in the garage. Okay, do yourself a favor. Get some gas up there and get an on-demand hot water system for that apartment. All right. Um, yeah. <laughs> the reason the kitchen sink seems okay because you're only trying to wash your hands. Okay. And it's 75 degrees. It feels great. But as soon as you get naked and stand under 75 degrees, you're ready to hit somebody, right? Because who swims in a pool that's 75 degrees? What you need is an on-demand hot water system. You can move the gas out there a lot easier and heat the water on demand than you can ship it out there. And I don't care if you're in South Florida or you're, you're, you're in the center of the earth. Moving hot water from one building to the next, if it's above ground, A, you're going to have the wind and the air temperature. There's going to be heat loss. If it's in the dirt, dirt's always cooler than the air. So you're done. And you probably buried the water line, which means you're automatically pretty darn cold down there. It's probably 50 degrees in the dirt. Three, three inches underneath the grass is 50 degrees. And that's what's killing your heat. He just said, thanks, Jeff. Greatest DIY channel information on any form of media. Well, yeah, he's not not incorrect about that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, uh, that's awesome. I'm happy to help. Um, we got returned, Sarah. I asked this cue in the forum yesterday, and I haven't got to it. I'm so sorry. I'll ask it here since I have you. Yeah, sure. Moving walls. Can I reuse studs? <gasps> Sarah, I answered that question. I don't care how ugly your wood is, okay? It can smell even. It's going to pass inspection. You can reuse studs over and over and over again for the rest of your life. No worries at all. Here's the thing. What you got to do is build your wall and give it a shake test. Okay? If it doesn't move, you pass code. Okay? And, and, and I remember reading this. You were using like steel brackets and all this. You were going way above and beyond. All right? I'm telling you right now. Your build is you don't have nothing to worry about. I understand when you're doing something new for the first time, there can be concerns in the back of your head. Oh, am I going to get in trouble? No. And even if you have an inspector come in and they, they look at your work and go, hmm, this is really curious. If they have any suggestions, what they're going to say is, you know, Sarah, perhaps if you could put a nail here or a screw here and then just take a picture and send it to me and I'll pass your permit. That's the worst thing that's going to happen to you. So I looked at your pictures. I think you did amazing work. You're above and beyond. You don't have to work that hard stuff, but I think you're going to be just fine. All right. But don't be afraid of the inspectors. They are your friends. They are there to look at your work and recognize this is someone who gives a damn. And if there's a problem, they'll bring it to your attention and ask you to fix it, tell you how to fix it, and then have them send you a picture. That's all they want. It's not scary. Okay. So don't worry about it. Um, this is not Russia. Uh, they're no, not going to drag you off to the gulag. You didn't build it right. It's all good. All right. So Ziggy says, I have a question about a sunroom. The old owner poorly built. It is sinking. Hmm. Problem with foundation. It's a good bet. It's on bricks with cement. Okay. I can get to it from removing the floor from inside. Do you have any suggestion on what foundation I should look into? Oh, boy. All right. Okay. So somebody decided to build an extension on a building without using footings. They just put it on brick. A little tiny more information about our house right here. 1976 house. No idea where sunroom was built. Also in an area where floods happen on the road. All right, Siggy, here's the thing. Um, you're going to want to open your floor. And then you want to do a Google search for a structural engineer. Okay? I know that sounds scary, but it's not. He's basically an expert on how to build stuff. They're going to come out to the house. They're going to take a look at your current situation. They're going to make recommendations for how you can fix it. It probably involves underpinning, which is just a process of like digging a hole under part of the wall and then adding the proper mix of concrete and rebar or whatever it is to support that wall properly in your soil conditions. And that's the key. Soil conditions are different every region of the world. 
Okay. And so the structural engineers that are in your area will know your soil conditions and be able to make recommendations for you to have success. If you try to solve this problem yourself, you could get 95% correct, do a whole ton of work and be right back to sinking again. Don't do structural work without getting help. It's a few hundred bucks. They'll come to your house. They'll do a site visit. They could either just say, oh, if this is easy. Do this and this, right? Because humans are nice. Or if it requires a major upgrade, they will draw up a plan and a strategy. They have their own stamp, okay? So you don't have to worry about building code officials and stuff. They'll just say, here, do this. And here's my stamp. You can do the work. You can follow the process. They'll, they'll, they'll outline it. They'll tell you every material, every process, every screw, every nail, every ounce of every mix. It's a beautiful way to go because you can have 100% confidence. You're not just going to get good advice from a guy like me. You're going to get advice from an expert in that field in your region who knows your soil conditions. And that is the key. All right. So um, structural engineer. I'm solved. All right. Cheers. Uh, yeah, I'm fired up. Robert, I uh, I just spent the last couple of days building a deck, baby. I love being outside. Oh, this is amazing. Did it buffered a couple of times? The signal? No, it's working. Well, it ain't us. I'll tell you that right now. We live in Ottawa, Canada, and we've got fiber optics up here, which means my upload speed is 100 times better than every interview being held by Zoom on national television all around the world right now. So the hell if you're buffering it's you we've done everything we can do to give you the best possible signal i guarantee it all right uh had to change my name to bob <laughs> okay well you can all can read what that means it is hot in houston i bet replacing a water line to the house less than a hundred dollars over six thousand for a plumber yeah you know why because it's hot and he doesn't want to do it either that's why, because he doesn't need your work. He's a plumber. Has anyone figured out yet that licensed trades don't need to do your job and they will just throw numbers out of their ass? And if you're crazy enough to pay it, then hallelujah for them, right? All right. Yeah, if you don't DIY today, you might as well just go get a second job to pay for it because it is not what it used to be. You know, the whole idea of society used to be, hey, Fred, you're good at making chairs. Make all the chairs for the whole town. And I'm really good at making tables, and I'll make all the tables for everybody. And then you and I can swap tables and chairs, and we're all set up. Not anymore. The government's got their hands so far up all of our backsides. Business is unaffordable. In the discussion. If you want to be one of these guys that spend your family fortune to get a renovation done, go right ahead. But for the rest of the normal folks in the world, we got to do it ourselves. Next. Eric, roughed in bathroom, plumbing, and basement. Okay. Interior perimeter is framed and insulated. Okay. Toilet pipe is 12 inch from the wall. Can I drop my water line sandwiched in the insulation of the framed wall? No. No. Eric, first of all, I don't know where you live, so I can't say yes. Go ahead and put your water line in, in your basement wall. Um, I don't know if you're coming from the ceiling or from, from uh, a few inches off the floor, right? Like, to be honest with you, if you're bringing a water line across a basement floor on an outside wall and you're six inches off the floor, you're so far below the frost line, if it's in the insulation, it ain't going to matter. Most times. But if you've got a friendly neighborhood mouse who digs a channel and you get a draft, you can still freeze your pipe. So generally speaking, you want to be on the interior of your vapor barrier insulation system to guarantee success. And that's all there is to it. Um, Cindy Cox just showed up. Cindy, it's been forever since I've seen you here in the chat. <laughs> just joking. How's it going? You finally done your walls. You're about to start your LVP for the first time. Right on. Some suggest going vertical and others horizontal. My home is two stories. What are your suggestions? Um, wow, I'm confused, Cindy. Actually, you're going to have to hit me up with a little more information. Because... You're done your walls, and you're putting an LVP, which is a flooring. How do you go vertical? Am I missing it? Is this? The, are we talking drywall or LVP? We're just starting. So here's another one, Robert. So finally done with the walls. About to start installing LVP. Okay.
Maybe she means like lengthwise. Okay, so yeah, yeah, yeah. So you might be talking about the, the, the length of the room. If you have like a rectangle, you're, you're, you're putting your plank along the longest wall. That's always your best option. Okay. Now, that's the basic answer. If you have a hallway in the mix, you want your hallway flooring to be in the length of the hallway. That's your best option. And so then you really got to decide, you know, what is going to drive me crazy more? If my hallway is the wrong way or if my room is the wrong way, right? There's no real right answer. But generally speaking, we go with the longest wall is the direction we run the flooring. Let me know if that solved your problem or not. And we can always visit it again with a second question. Matthew Fenty is adding vinyl flooring to a basement. 1900s concrete basement, Pennsylvania, adding dry core sub. Thoughts on Lux vinyl plank versus vinyl sheet? Okay, great question. So here's the thing. Um, vinyl sheet only comes in rolls 12 feet wide. So if your room is more than 12 feet wide, you have to do a seam. Seaming it can be really tricky, right? And it's not always perfect. Um, luxury vinyl plank, however, in a 1900s concrete basement, generally speaking, that floor is not going to be flat. So if it has a bowl to it, you might find that putting in a vinyl sheet might have more flexibility to fill the contour properly. That's what I'm saying. Okay. Because planks don't do well in a bowl. So if your floor is flat, go plank. If it's not, go with the sheet. All right. Woo. Moisturize your wood so it swells, you say. If it's cracking, treat it like skin. All right, throw a little oil of Olay on there. <laughs> Jeff would laugh at how the previous owner did the sunroom. The windows are all boarded up and painted. Oh, wow. Whew. Sounds like you bought yourself something that needs some TLC, Siggy. My goodness. Mm. Oh, there we go. East Memorial Baptist Church. We finally got their question. They joined the membership today. Will here. Not sure why this is showing on my church's account. <laughs> Just relocated my laundry hookup. Right? Fantastic. Well, now the whole church can ask me questions. What a deal. All right. Just relocated my laundry hookup in my 1980s home in Alabama. Okay. Now my dryer trips every time I plug in the dryer. So you did it wrong. That's, that's the easy answer. There's only two things that are possible here. When you hook up your dryer, you've got to have your black and your red where the power parts are, your white where the neutral goes, and the ground where the ground goes. If you mix any of those up, it's going to trip right away. Okay? Turn off the breaker, pull the plug off, check the back, and make sure that you got it right. I just did this recently. The ground is alone, and then on the other side, it is black or red, and then white, and then black or red. Okay? So double check that you've got it installed cor correctly. Basically, when you look at the plug, the L's are the power, right? And then there is a, a circle, which is the ground, and the top is the neutral. Um, I just finished doing that video. Well, it's going to be out in a few weeks, I imagine. Maybe a month or so. Which one is that? The laundry hookup. Oh, yeah. That'll be a little while. We're talking like end of September-ish, maybe October. A little while, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, so that's not going to be any help to you right now. But um, cool, it won't set the breaker if you got the ground or the power or the neutral in the wrong spot. So... That is the benefit of modern electricity, right? You can't actually turn something on that's going to kill you. So that's good. So just double check you got your connections and you should be all right. Okay. Um, Christina, welcome to Money in the Bank. Welcome to the membership program, guys. Uh, I should just say, if you're just joining us, if you're just joining us, you're probably watching the beginning of the show, unless it's live. I guess they see right now. If you're just joining us, we're taking questions from our members of our channel. And there are thousands of them, so God help us. We're trying to get through this as best we can. And if you got a question, you want to be a member, then sign up. Go ahead, do it. If you don't want to be a member, just throw us a super chat, and I can help you out. Um, I, anybody that's willing to help themselves, I'm willing to help. All right. So this is how it works. Uh, works fine without the dryer. Is plugged in. Okay. So if 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 the if the circuit works without the dryer plugged in then it's probably a problem with the dryer. Oh, dude, I have no idea. I'm not an appliance technician. I really can't help you with that. All I know is that if, if the dryer's not plugged in and your circuit isn't tripping, you didn't wire it wrong. Next. I don't know what else to say. All right. Uh, okay. 
Gage, welcome to welcome Louie. Okay, Chris has got a question. Um, apparently he loves my stuff. Cool. I got the right stuff, Eric. Probably an easy drywall question. Probably, considering drywall is pretty easy. I know it scares and intimidates a lot of people, but it's one of the easiest products in the world to work with once you get the hang of it. He's finished in his basement, and he has a bulkhead that's an L shape. Can I join tapered edges of drywall sheets to the butt ends of another? Sure. No problem. Just do yourself a favor. Um, set up yourself a little bit of a quick set mix, or if you're patient, regular drywall compound, and just nice and tight fill in the gap of the taper. And then you can treat it like a butt joint once it's dry. And you can tape the joint, okay? It's that simple, Chris, and it'll work just fine. All right? Don't try to put the tape on first because then it'll be like all bumpy and all. It'll drive you nuts. Just fill in the gap first and then treat it like a butt joint. All right, cheers. Okay, Louis just acquired a 1958 house in Quebec City. Beautiful. Old chimney, center of the house. Nice. Goes from roof all the way across two floors of the basement. We want to get rid of it. Any advice, contracting, pricing? You know, the best thing about a chimney is if you start at the top, you can literally take it away one brick at a time, and it's totally a DIY project. It is a self-supporting structure in the home. So you can just start removing bricks from the top, close up your roof, seal it up. You want to hire a roofer for that? You can, or you can just... Do it yourself. It's not that tricky. And you can just slowly work your way down through the house, taking your chimney apart. Not a problem. Just do yourself a favor and don't start at the bottom. That's the secret. And then you're going to be just fine. I wouldn't hire a contractor because it is a labor job. Might hire a roofer depending because homes in 1958 are really unique with peaks and valleys and slopes. And um, you might want to get somebody up there who's very comfortable working in that environment to reseal your, your watershed on your roof. But other than that, do it complete yourself. Okay, Gage says, uh, Hi, Jeff, I'm installing a butcher block counter and the last three feet I want to be floating. Okay, the wall is plaster. Open the wall to mount to stud. Okay, any plaster-related videos coming? Um, not until I get into a really old house. I need to get into an old house. We're going to look for that. Here's the thing about uh, plaster. Um, treat it like drywall if you're if you're if you're working with it. The best thing about plaster is you can you can you can break apart a small amount, and then you can find your studs in the wall. Once you've located the studs by using a measuring tape, measuring back and forth across the hole, underneath the block, then you know where to put your L brackets. Okay, and don't worry about it. It's not going to be all that tricky. Um, for fixing plaster and repairing and then painting. Just use an oil primer. Guys, anytime you've got plaster, just prime it with a flat oil. That'll transition. That'll bond the old plaster to new technology paints. And you can paint all the brand new acrylic latex paint right over top. Never going to be a problem. All right? Cheers. And welcome to Matt to the membership program. Uh, Christina has a question here. She has a basement room that she's converting into a bedroom. <sighs> Don't tell the city. They'll charge you more taxes. <laughs> How do I remove the carpet glue? <laughs> 1981 house with carpet. Mm. Should you seal the concrete or put a floating floor in it? Well, listen, carpet glue isn't that thick. So I would say ignore it. And if the carpet was glued directly to the concrete, I'm saying that's going to make a cold bedroom. So maybe you should consider using that dry core thermal insulation rigid foam product before you put your flooring down or even a subfloor panel system for putting your flooring down. Or at the very least, just roll out some cork underlayment and then put in your LVP or your, your laminate flooring, and you're going to be just fine. Trying to remove old glue is a lot of work with no real benefit if you're going to use an underlayment under your floor. It can absorb all the rough bumps and patches, and you aren't going to have any problem, Christina. Okay? So cheers. Uh, enjoy your upgrade. All right. Cindy Cox, uh, we're still back at the vertical horizontal. It's not helping. We gotta, we gotta go. I wonder how far behind I am on the questions tonight. It seems like I just can't seem to catch up. All right, Bradley Gibbs. Now he says the T11 siding is particle board, not OSB or ply. Ah, yeah. 
Well, now we're now we're getting into a place. If your T11 siding is particle board and not OSB or plywood, that does change a lot of things. So every time you put a nail in a uh, side of a house to hang vinyl, a certain amount of moisture will travel through that nail penetration. So I'm going to suggest in that case, take off the T11 siding. If it's a particle board, it's not going to be the house exterior sheathing. And if it is, you're probably better off removing it and adding a new sheathing, like a 3 8 OSB. Okay? Just to be honest with you. I mean, I hate to say it, but nowadays they're just using house wrap right over the studs. And then they're adding siding. Like, I don't, I don't think that's a great idea, but it can be done if, if it's a budget issue because I know plywood bloody well costs a lot of money, right? So it's a thought. But uh, yeah, you can't expect a particle board to hold a nail when it's exposed to moisture. All right. Joshua Newman, thoughts on replacing a 30-inch vanity with a 24-inch live edge and vessel sink in an already remodeled small bathroom trying to make it feel bigger. Um, why 24-inch live edge? If you want to make your bathroom feel bigger, use an 18-inch deep vanity instead of a 22 or a 23, right? That's really the secret. We are really behind, aren't we? There's a lot of questions. Boy. There's a lot of questions tonight. Yeah, like, we'll get there sooner or later. We're getting through them. All right. Um, if you want to make it feel bigger, go with a 30-inch vanity with a live edge and the vessel sink. The fact that you don't have all that cabinet underneath is going to make the room feel bigger. But don't give up counter space. You're going to hate yourself for it. All right? Now stick to the 30 inch, do the vessel sink, and then just leave it open underneath. And the room will feel bigger just because of that. But what good is being in a big room if it doesn't function, right? All right. Cheers. Um, Matt says he has a 30 by 8 front porch that needs to be redone. Original owner put no posts, etc. It's Midwest areas or an alternative to pouring concrete. How far apart for Joyce? We're doing a live show without pictures, my friend. I have no idea how to help you with that much information. Matt, you're going to have to send me a picture in the forum, okay? Guys, if you don't know how to use the forum, just go to the homepage of Home Renovision DIY. Check, click on community. There's information there. And for every member, you can follow the links, blah, blah, blah. Get up, set up on the forum. Take pictures, upload them, send them, ask me questions. I can't help you to diagnose a problem that's that complicated tonight. It's just not going to work. All right. Sorry to throw a right back at you, but uh, we're playing catch, and I look forward to getting that email. All right. Cheers. <laughs> Sandy Rose, welcome to Money in the Bank, darling. It's good to see you again. Uh, how you doing, girl? <laughs> uh, all right. Floors, move walls, have linoleum. Now there's a linoleum with concrete showing. Before I install a OP, should I add linoleum patches to cover the concrete and make floors level before I let it? No. Sarah, if you have uneven floor surfaces and you have linoleum that's glued to the concrete, the best solution for that is go out and grab yourself a bag of floor leveler, mix up a batch, use the floor leveler to patch all of the parts of the floor, and then put your flooring on top. Okay? Boom. Problem solved. All right. Siggy, I'm glad I finally caught you guys on live. Appreciate it. Oh, cheers. All right. Yeah, here we go. Lots of love. Everybody's getting to say each other. Yeah, Sandy, you get more love than I do. It's amazing. All right. Sandy has been a, um, a channel subscriber since, I'm going to guess, August of 2016. Right from the very beginning. It's been one of our one of our most encouraging people in the comment section, and we love you for it, Sandy. Thank you. All right. Um, and she knows everybody on here. So now the comments, wow, look at this conversation. It's going crazy. Uh, Paula wants to know how you can remove grout stain from tile. Well, um, what we're going to do is tomorrow morning, you're going to go down the store. You're going to get a grout haze remover. Okay. That's the product you're going to need. You're going to want to maybe even use a uh, blue sanding sponge for drywall and uh, blood, sweat, and tears, Paula. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure why you have a stain. It might be more of a um, residue left on the tile. And there's a lot of different kinds of grout out there, right? So if you're using a regular unsanded grout, it wipes off. If you're using a polymer modified and you let it sit and dry and cure for a day or two, you can be running a problem. If you're using um, epoxy, well, 
then you better be wide awake and sober because if you leave that stuff on the wall, it's there for life. So it depends on what kind of grout you're using. But generally speaking, the grout haze remover is going to be able to lift off excess grout that's left on the surface of the tile. Okay. Good luck with that. Um, to clarify the siding on my house is paint, stucco, and CMU. Darwin is the window guy with the wet wall. Darwin, that really sucks. That means you've got some work to do. Stucco still comes up to a soffit, okay? And wind-driven rain still goes into the soffit. And then the wall is actually built. It's an assembly. It's got a felt and then an airspace and then stucco so that the water that gets in through the soffit can go down behind the stucco in front of that felt where the airspace is. And it should have an exit at the bottom. What's going on with you is it's coming down, it's hitting that window and it's driving inside. If you don't have flashing, the window's installed incorrectly, the only way to fix that is to chip out a little bit of the stucco, put in flashing, and then re-add the stucco, unfortunately. Wow. Was that Jason's question? I was sending this. No, it's Darwin at the top of the screen. Okay. Um, <laughs> ever dealt with Japanese knotweed? I'm going to say no. <laughs> This is all over the east coast of the U.S., but it's not in Ottawa. Oh, it destroys foundations. Oh, that's an aggressive plant. Yikes. Yeah, I would say don't have any. That would be my recommendation. Use that damn herbicide and kill that stuff. Wow. Okay. My house has a deck that is two feet high. Under the deck are big patio stones and concrete stairs, which are hard to remove. Sure. That's why they built the deck, because all that concrete was falling apart. What are my best options to build something under the deck to slope the water away? Oh, that's really interesting. So you have water pooling, do you? Uh, it's two feet high. You can kind of have access, but not really. Hmm. Hmm. Really, the only thing I can suggest is, is if you can find access underneath that deck, and take a shovel and throw in some limestone screenings, right? Or, or small gravel and create a slope. And then get yourself some geotextile cloth that they use for landscaping because it generally diverts water or plastic if you have access to plastic. And then put the plastic on top of the stone and then throw a little more stone on top so it doesn't move around. Then you're gonna have a natural water diversion system coming out of your deck, okay? Um, yeah, having good slope of water away from the house is so important. Brandon Moore, cheers, man. Welcome to Money in the Bank. And the Sandman, look at this. Oh, somebody's using the Super Chat feature. <laughs> it's, thanks, Jeff. Greatest DIY channel information on any form of media. That's nice. Mm, truer words have never been spoken. That's nice, That's nice. That's nice buddy. That's Appreciate nice. it. I'm sorry you're not even on the chat anymore. We're probably half an hour behind on the chat. Chris Anderson's in the chat. Cheers, Chris. And Raina's in the chat. Hi, Raina. Let's get to her question here. Uh, replacing vents, registers, and ceiling, but don't know how to keep them from falling out. Uh, some have screws, others don't. House built in 77, California. Okay, here's the deal. If you've got register vents in the ceiling and you put the screws in, there's no wood there. All right? They all have a flange. So if you go to the store, Raina, you can buy a pole, an extension pole, and it has little clips on it. And it, it can go pretty much perfect. But then you can twist the pole to make it perfectly tight. So what you do is you go take a little bit of clear silicone and you put it on the back side of the vent flange, right? You stick it up in the hole and you put that pole there and then you twist it till it's tight and then you take the pole off the next morning. Don't ever need a screw again. All right? Cheers. Yep. It's, uh, it's going to be hell for the next guy. But it's not your problem. All right. <laughs> Somebody should have put blocking in your ceiling so you could put the screws in. They screwed up. So now this is the only fix that I know that works. So Anthony, shower temp issue. I bet his handle max temp adjustment wasn't increasing. So uh, that's also possible. If the kitchen's good, that's a good point, Anthony. Maybe if the kitchen temperature is good and it's a new build, you might have had a thermostatic pressure um, ring inside the handle of the shower valve going back about an hour, right? And if you open up the handle, you can take that ring out and you can change it so it allows more an increase in the balance between hot and cold of the mixture. That's really good, Anthony. Well done. 
Uh, Brandon said, a 1920 cinder block house in Pennsylvania. A lot of folks in Pennsylvania. Plaster and laugh. Love it. No insulation. Who needs it? 1920. Fuel was cheap, right? Here, here's five cents. Heat me for a winner. <laughs> Not that way anymore. How should you insulate the walls? If you have a plaster and lath house in today's economy and you have no insulation in the walls, the last thing you need to be concerned about is your plaster and lath. Rip it all out. First of all, 1920, seriously? If you still have your plaster and lath, did you even get your wiring updated, Brandon? You might have some really old wiring. All of your exterior walls, dude, I would totally just rip out the plaster and lath, insulate, start all over again, and then put in new drywall. No hesitation. Wouldn't even think twice. Um, there is one other option, which is to drill holes in every stud bay cavity, right? And you can pour in cellulose and it'll get it 90% filled and it'll provide you a pretty reasonable amount of insulation. Um, but nothing works as good as tearing the wall off and starting from scratch to make sure that you have no drafts. Because even if you insulated the wall 90%, you're going to have drafts. Drafts means you feel cold. If you feel cold, you turn the heat up, right? And so you're wasting energy. So why would you renovate and then waste energy? It all works together. All right. Chris wants to know about repaint a basement floor for a vapor barrier. Uh, it's very temporary. First of all, it's not a long-term solution. But if you want to paint your floor every few years as a vapor barrier, it could help if you have an old house. It's not the end of the world. Um, I'd rather put in a subfloor system and then never think about it again. Uh, Wendy said she's never had it explained better. Thanks for the tip. I don't even remember the tip, Wendy, but you're welcome. All right. <clears throat> the lead rant. Oh, God, don't even get me going on lead. The lead rant, I'd be laughing too. It's like, you know, it's not leading. They're following, okay? It's just they're following. <laughs> they're following. God, they're not leading nothing. Please. All right. All right. We have three major problems in this world. To live in the top 1% of this ball that we live on, you got to have access to clean water, access to healthcare, and somewhere to sit when it rains outside, okay? That's what top 1% looks like. And we really give a damn about the top 1% of the top 1% of the top 1%? Seriously, come on, yeah, let's get over ourselves. <sighs> oh, did I mention 80% of the people in this country aren't in the 1%? Let's put our money where it matters. Next, Miss Tina Michelle in the house, everybody. Inventing for your dryer, how many elbows are you allowed to have? Wow. That's a, wow. Tina's trying to stump me. All right, Tina. Two. Okay. One at the, one at the dryer and one towards the outside of the house. And it can be up to 25 feet away. That's where I live. I don't know what it's like where you live, but if you've got a different answer and you stump me, then I would love to hear about it in the comment section. All right. Um, super chat I want to skip down to real quick. Holy cow. Yeah. I am so far behind. All right, new rule. Um, let's try to get up to speed. How's that? Oh, say so, okay. So, Shahar, how do I paint flaking paint on either a door or wall or deck? You remove the flaking paint and paint it over it, but it wasn't flat and uniform. Yeah, there are only two ways to actually do a paint job when you've got flaking paint. One is you have to sand everything silky smooth, or you have to remove all the paint. Third option, remove what you're painting and put a new surface on. It is never going to look great, right? So you got two choices. You want it to look perfect or do you want it to be protected? A lot of exterior stuff, it's very common for people to just remove the loose stuff and then just prime it and then paint it. And you can tell when you get close to the house, whoa, yeah, it's like a password quilt. But at least it's protected. It's not rotting. It's not getting wet. It's not getting termites, right? And that's the goal. We don't want the house falling down. But if you want it pretty, you got to put in the blood, sweat, and tears. All right, let's just do this. Um, we are so far behind, it's disgusting. Yeah, you're doing so good. We're doing great. I'm having a lot of fun. I have no idea if I'm answering the question of people that are still here. All right, so let's do a break. We're going to say hi to Franklin. Welcome to the, welcome to the program. Alina, welcome to the program. Steve, all of you, welcome to the membership. All right, um, let's do that. We got Alina's question right here. Okay. Moved to Gatineau from Ottawa last year to buy my first home. Would you happen to know anyone who services Gatineau? Got a bathroom with a rot under the toilet and probably the shower. Mm, ouch. <clears throat> I 
Okay. Uh, Gatineau has their own rules. Alina, you can only get a tradesman who is um, RBQ certified, which means it's a tax thing. It's got to be uh, some company from Quebec who's a, 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 okay, so we can't have anybody from Ontario travel over there to work unless they get that designation. And it is not an easy thing to get. So you're going to have to get a contractor from Gatineau. Here's what I do know, all right? Uh, the labor force in Gatineau, the guys that know how to do renovations, is 10 times that of Ottawa. You are in good hands. There are tons of guys over there who can help you out. So you don't, I don't have a referral, but I do know that you should have someone local wherever you move to, all right? Just talk to some friends. Uh, what I usually do is I go down to like a local restaurant and I ask the guy from the restaurant, like an Italian bakery or something, all right? And ask Nona. Here's advice for everybody. If you need a contractor, go to an Italian sandwich shop and ask the old lady working in the sandwich shop if she knows a contractor and she'll have a cousin or something in the business. She'll tell Vinny to come over. Vinny's going to be working in your house. You go see Nona every week. Give her updates. And if there's ever any problem, she's going to slap Vinny up the back of the head and take care of you. All right. Italian guys will, well, they'll manage the reputation with their community more, more than you have any concept of. All right. And they are the, best people to work for because they have community and they have responsibility to that community. If you just go to the internet, God only knows what you're going to get. I'll take Nona's recommendation any day of the week. All right. We are going to slide right to the very beginning, right to the front. We're going to try to get back up to speed with everything. Uh, still got to deal with Cindy's question. I have no idea. Listen, if you're in the, if you're in the chat and you asked a question, and we haven't got to yet, you're going to have to ask again because we are so far behind. I don't even have a clock on this, but there are hundreds. Wild Will, welcome to Money in the Bank. Um, here's a question from him. Hey, I want to know how to go about updating my cabinets myself without having a contractor. Home Depot come to do the measurements. Can you give me some advice? Yep. You can measure your own cabinets. Seriously, if you measure off your kitchen, you can go to a Home Depot or a Lowe's and sit down with the kitchen designer and they will give you exactly what fits in that room based on what you have now. Okay, they don't have to come up and measure for you. You can bring the measurements. Measure the, the back wall of the kitchen and measure the face, okay? Take a couple of pictures, just go down there. These guys, they know what they're doing and they can order brand new cabinets that are the same exact cabinets that you have now, but in a modern look so that it's a remodel, not a renovation. You don't need a permit and you can swap all your cabinets out. And you can do this yourself. It's a great way to update a house. Uh, Jake LaRosa, new member. Let's say hi to Jake. Uh, good. We're gonna, huh? Yeah, I think we're good. I think we're just going to fire down. Yeah, you let's go. let's just go. Unless there's another super chat that we're missing or a member that we got to say hi to. A couple here. We, got some we did Shahar. There's William. William, uh, William, welcome to the membership. Matthew, welcome to the membership. Do they have questions? And Jamal, welcome to the membership. Uh, let's see, let's see, uh, okay. Let's go down a little bit, see if Jamal and Matthew William are in the questions there. Nurse Lucy is here. Sorry, Nurse Lucy. We are going and chocolate's here tonight. We're gonna just go. Let's get let's get up to date. Okay, big record scratch. If you have a question, you're gonna have to ask it again. We are going to go up to date now. We're starting with Michael Stillwagon. Holy cow! Become friends with Nona is a great tip. I'm telling you right now. All you need is a sandwich shop, and you can get a contractor. All right. Um, he, Michael's remodeling a bathroom. Removed the cast iron tub and found one and a quarter inch drain pipe. Yeah, it's normal. That's standard plumbing back in the day. Plans are to install a walk-in shower with larger two-inch drain. What are your options? Ah, okay. Michael, here's the thing. Um you don't have to update your one and a quarter inch drain, okay? You have a, a drain line and then a P-trap. Right after the P-trap, you can put in bushings and go from one quarter to one and a half, one and a half to two inch. And you can install a modern fixture on a one and a quarter inch drain. It just takes forever, that's all. <laughs> that's the only problem, all right? It's just really, really slow. So as long as that one and a quarter is vented, you should be okay. So if, if you uh, uh, fill up your, your – if you turn on the water in your tub and it drains as fast as the water comes in, then you know when you put in your shower, it's not going to overflow.
But if it doesn't drain as fast as you put the water in, then you might have to open up more and change your plumbing and get a permit and update your system. Okay, my friend? All right, let's get on with it. Um, Vitali, I think that's how you say it. You're from Toronto. Okay, you built a shed, 16 by 6, one slope roof. Walls are 8 feet and 7 feet. Use your amazing shed videos as a tutorial. Great. Did anybody tell you that you can't make a shed 16 feet long without a permit? But that's okay. Shh, don't tell anybody. Main difference is I've put on six posts. Posts are in concrete in the ground. Okay, cool. And that is just some love for helping Vitaly make a shed. Just a nice thing. I think, dude, cheers to you. That is really sweet. Thank you. Yeah. And as long as nobody causes you any issues about your long shed, who cares? And if they do, the, the, what, the, what's, the, what's the city going to do? Say, hey, it's too long. Uh, it was there when I moved in. They'll let you. They'll, they'll, leave, they'll leave you alone. They're, they got bigger fish to fry, dude. I'm telling you right now. All right. So where am I going here? Right down to Jake? Or to the top of this page? Let's, uh, why don't we do Nurse, Nurse Lucy here? We're going to start at Nurse Lucy? Does that work? All right. We're starting at Nurse Lucy. We are only four comments from the beginning. If you do not have a question in the last four comments on this page, we need to ask it again. Sorry for all the inconvenience, but I'm only one man. I don't I, have a cape. I, I, told, I told everybody to ask their questions in the forum if you miss it. Oh, yeah, because, you know, I have nothing better to do with my night when I get home. <laughs> that's awesome. Oh, that's cool. I, yeah, no, seriously, if, if you got to run and you can't hang around and watch the rest, feel free. Hit the forum. Um, I'm happy to help. Nurse Lucy, re-ask. I want to refloor the entire lower floor with the same flooring, probably LVP. Don't know how important transitions are. Zero importance whatsoever, Nurse Lucy. Lecture vinyl plank has an expansion contraction rate of almost zero, so don't worry about it. Um, the new vinyl that are coming out on the market now are starting to put on the box so they can go 800 up to 2,000 square feet of flooring without a transition. They've finally done the math and figured it out. I've been preaching this for years, but they finally did the math and paid for the scientific test, and they agree with me. You don't need any transition, so just go with it. It's a great look. Where the hell am I, dude? You're coming back? I'm getting somebody away. I'm, I'm, I'm okay, reading all kinds of funny stuff on my screen right now. That's right. Okay. You're convincing it. No, nope. your husband is um, incorrect. He'd be correct if it was laminate. He'd be correct two years ago if he was listening to the manufacturers only because they didn't do the testing to guarantee the product. But we don't need it. Moving on. And if he's still convinced... Um, I don't know where you are, nurse, Lucy, but uh, go to Floor and Decor. Your new products, they stay right on the box, okay? Uh, 2,000 square feet. So that'll be enough to convince them. Jahar said, I missed the super chat. <laughs> no! My question is, how do I paint flaking paint? No, I, I did answer that, Shahar. The answer is you just sand it and prime it with an oil-based primer and then paint it. And if you want it to be pretty, then you've got to sand it all off, okay? That's the only way to make it pretty. But you can make it functional by sanding and adding oil paint you got to get rid back to new wood you can't have gray wood and have paint stick to it or it'll flake again so you're going to sand it back to new wood add oil like an oil zinzer or something like that and then you can add in whatever paint you want on top cheers can flexible ducts sag bob and weave i have to get creative with my basement finishing joist space is at a premium um yeah they can so it's best to support them every couple of feet just get um Get yourself some all round in the plumbing department. It's a metal band with holes, okay? And stretch it across your joist cavities to help support the weight, okay? And you can keep everything pretty nice and tight. All right, where are we here, dude? I had uh, over here, uh, Darley, Darley Castro. Asking again, okay, I had a contractor remove my tile. He ended up messing up the concrete with the machine he was using. Okay. In addition, he did not remove the thin set because he said it couldn't be done. What is the easiest way to remove thin set by myself? And should I level the floor? I want to put L luxury vinyl. Okay. Excuse me. Sorry about that. Um, first of all, um, we just rented a machine from Home Depot. And it is like a mini jackhammer on a cart. And you can adjust it, darling, and it goes about 45 degrees. And it should take the thin set off the concrete. That is standard, and you should only have a little bit left here and there, and you could use a cup grinder to clean up a couple spots. But it is not hard to remove thin set from concrete because 
most of the time they're not using really expensive thin set. They're using the cheap stuff because why would you spend good money on thin set when you're on concrete? So it is definitely possible to remove. It is just a lot of work. Now, I don't know how they removed the tile. Was it by hammer? But they didn't use the right tool. It's $150 a day to rent in Canadian dollars, probably about a buck 20 down in the States. So if you have a contractor and he doesn't do his job properly because he don't want to spend money on the proper tool, I would reconsider my contracting relationship. Done. Enough said. However, having said that, if you don't want to spend the money and the time and the effort and the blood, sweat and tears and the dust and everything else, yes, you could just level it. Prime it first because thin set does not bond to floor leveler. So there's a primer for it, multi-surface bonding primer. You just paint it on with a roller and then you can pour primer of the leveler on that and it'll stick. It'll be amazing. You have a great surface. You can put luxury vinyl right over top of that. No problem at all. Cheers to you. Next. There was a great question here by user asked. He said, any pep talks or words of wisdom for old house owners when things get overwhelming? Any pep talk for words of wisdom for old house owners when things get overwhelming? Um, yes. Okay, here it is. Every hour you spend on your house, you're making more money than you do at your job. That'll motivate you. And if it gets overwhelming and you need to take a break, take a break. It's okay. You don't have to renovate every weekend. It's just an option. Right? Feel free. Splurge. Spend some money on yourself once in a while. Nothing wrong with that at all. All right? But yeah, just remember, everything you do is, is, is a, it, you're heading in the right direction every time you spend any time on your house. And if it gets to be too much and you just need a break, well, then bloody well, take it. Because you can't. Ed Quintana, a little super chat here. Ed wants to know how he can remove really dark stain yes. and bring wood back to its original color. I have a bunch of wood trim at home, but want natural stain instead of dark. Wow. Is there even an answer to that question? A whole ton of sanding. Here's the thing about stain, Ed. Um, it penetrates. So if you don't like the dark color, change the stain or really sand the living daylights out of it. You can try bleaching it as well and see if you can have any success with that. Um, it all depends on, this, on, on, on the stain, the penetration, the quality of it, quantity of it, uh, what kind of wood you're dealing with. Um, what your patience tolerance is. <laughs> it's a labor of love to go from dark to light. I'll tell you that right now. Um, most people, when they're done with the dark stain, they go to paint because it's a lot easier, right? Light sand, uh, oil primer, and then a latex paint over top. Um, that's usually the easiest move. Going from dark to light stain, that's a labor of love. Luke, welcome to Money in the Bank. And Luis, uh, he says he cannot thank us enough for the videos. He's become I have become a plumber, electrician, drywaller, tiler, thanks to your guidance. I don't know if I should take credit for that or just say, God, <laughs> people are always amazed what you're able to do. You know what? It's funny because um, it's not that hard, is it? Like, look, here's Luis. He's learned everything. It's not that hard. You just got to have the, the cannolis to try. All right. He wants to know what's the best way to measure windows for ordering. Ha <laughs> ha. All right. Um, Luis, here's the issue. You take off the window casing on the inside of the house. Okay, there will be a jam extension or you will see the end of the side of the window. Whether there's a jam extension or not, that's the outside measurement of the window. So you measure across and then the height. So when you go to the window company, you say, I got a 24 by 36. All right. And then they're going to say, what kind of operation is it? And casement means it's one window and you crank and it opens up. All right. Um, Slider means there's two pieces of glass and one slides over in front of the other. And double hung means there's a top and a bottom piece and they slide down. Okay, single hung means only one part of it moves. And um, that's all you really need to know. If you have an operation like a casement, okay, and it opens like this, then you say it's a left-hand casement. Because the way you order it is you measure from the inside, but you look from the outside to see where the function is. So if you're on the other side and it looks like it's on the left hand, that it's hinged. That's the only secret. All right, my man. There you go. Windows 101. So first, last, I have three parts here. First, last, Sweet. three parts. Okay. I cannot thank you enough for your videos. Become a plumber. Well, that's Luis. Wrong. <clears throat> Done that. I have an entire home water purifier on city water. Okay. Every day the system performs self-cleaning 
system produces a lot of wastewater. When installed, it put in the sump bucket. Can I put the waste hose directly into the sewage inject pump bucket? Do I need a trap or one way valve to prevent sewer gas from escaping and going to the water purifier? The reason that I want to do this is because the sump ejects into the backyard and every winter my entire backyard turns an unwanted ice skating rink. Okay, <clears throat> so here's your answer. What you're going to want to do is you want to take this whole system that you got and if it's under a pump, you want to take the pump and put a 40, I'm sorry, 90 degree angle with a slope. So it becomes, goes from pump to gravity. Once it becomes gravity, you can then tie into your existing waste system. Okay, your, your DWV system. Put a pump to the elbow and then a little gravity to the DWV. And you can seal that up. You don't have to worry about air or venting or anything else, okay? Because you're pumping, you're not creating pressure. Your pump should have its own venting. If it's a lot of water, you could consider calling Santa Flow. Santa Flow is a company that makes special pumps for unique plumbing situations. And they have small pumps that you can run that system into. You're going to have to connect it to venting but it can do that pumping up and pumping over system for you, okay? And that is a great solution. If you get that much water in your backyard because of this pump, I'm guessing Santa Flow is a great solution. A couple hundred bucks, you can install it yourself, just plugs in with a 15 volt, sorry, 15 amp plug, no big deal, okay? So write that down, Santa Flow, and then contact uh, Wolseley Plumbing in Canada or Ferguson in the United States, and they'll have the Santa Flow system for you. All right. Woo! Let's get on to the next one. Franklin Ruffin. I thought this was interesting. Franklin says, sorry, you had had you spoken on using ductless mini split as a whole house solution. Um, any opinion? Yeah, I love it. I'm actually in an Airbnb right now, and we are uh, bedroom, hallway, bathroom, bathroom, kitchen, living room, dining room. There's too many splits. It's more than enough. They don't have to work all day long even though we're in 30 degree heat over here in summer in Ottawa, which is like 85 to 90 down in the States, you guys. So we're plenty hot, right? And it works. Um, I have no problem with ductless mini split. The technology has definitely surpassed what it was 20 years ago. So if it's a solution for your problem, consider it because it can be really quick and simple. And there are products out there now. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Cool, actually, the name Mr. Cool is a company. They're in the States, but they sell a ductless mini split. They have a DIY version. So the, the lines for the air conditioning unit are already pre-charged, right? And it's a lot of work. You got to be able to drill holes. You got to do the electrical and you got to hook everything up. And, but the point is, is it, it's completely doable as a DIY to do it yourself, okay? Um, April Wilkerson has a channel and she did a DIY uh, Mr. Cool installation. It's very thorough and actually is really, really good. So go ahead and check it out. And uh, yeah, go ahead, use it. Like uh, one of those for every 400 square feet is more than enough. All right. Okay. Uh, Rias, good. Sure. Basement floor is wavy on level. Poured after foundation, approximately two and a half inches across 30 feet. How to level for LVP and stuff. Okay. This is a Paris 99. <clears throat> yeah, I get it. So this is normal. Right? Like here we are in a basement and everybody wants to use a flooring. That's not suitable for a basement floor. What do you do? You, you've got too much bowl, right? And the flooring says you can't install with that much bowl. What's the solution? You can level the floor. It'll cost you 800 to 1,000 bucks. Or don't use vinyl flooring. <laughs> like, I mean, I'm, I don't know how to get around it. I mean, there's really no, there's no, Miracle solution here. The, the, the best flooring for a basement that has that kind of a bowl, put in a subfloor system and install carpet. It's more forgiving than any other flooring on the market. Don't be afraid of it. It might be the best solution. Now, by the time you price out hiring someone to install your carpet, you might realize that putting a thousand bucks into subflooring is actually not a bad idea. <laughs> <But> <laughs> there is no cheap solution to a bowl floor if you want to put in vinyl. It doesn't exist. All right. So maybe we should do that video. Because I get this question all the time. Because it's one of the big parameters on the warranty on the flooring. The companies are all like, oh, I remember, you can only have so much difference in the slope over a certain many feet. And 
Otherwise, there's no warranty. And everybody gets upset. Oh, the warranty. They design these warranties for a reason, right? They design these warranties so that they can always say, oh, I'm sorry, you were outside the parameters of the warranty. Warranties are not designed for you to actually get actually warranty work. No, this is construction, guys. Where in the hell did you ever see a warranty that was actually honored in construction? Like Schluter has a warranty. Hey, if your bathroom fails, huh, you can have brand new products. No problem. One catch. We're going to come out to your house. We're going to tear apart your bathroom. When we find out how you screwed up, you don't get a dime. And you have to pay it for our time to do the research. That's a hell of a warranty. Where's the warranty there? Can you imagine? It's not like automotive. Okay, Automotive is different. There's warranties there. Things break. They replace them. Warranty. Construction. Install it under all this huge book of parameters. And if you make any mistake at all, there's no warranty. That's not a warranty. Okay, it's an excuse to say screw off. That's construction. Get over it. If you're thinking of trying to do things to make sure you get your warranty, you're never going to get your warranty. All right? At a thousand warranty calls, one guy might get a dollar ninety-five from the company. Show me anywhere where you got warranty work done, and I <laughs> oh, I want to watch myself because I want to almost put myself out there, Eric. You know, anybody out there has an example where they actually called a company and got actual warranty? please. They're all going to do is warranty their product, right? So you can have an entire $30,000 bathroom built on floor leveler that failed. What are they going to do? They're going to have you a bag of floor leveler. That's your warranty. What good is it? Enough of that. No more rants. Well, maybe not. Maybe a few. Okay. William's got messed up drywall. Yeah. Join the club. He wants to install four by eight beadboard paneling from floor to ceiling and Wayne Scott three quarter way up. Divided with trim and paint, a proportion of paneling to color. Will this look okay? It all depends on if you know what the hell you're doing. Well, I mean, really. Um, asking me about the aesthetics of your, your, your finished carpentry project, it sounds fine. You want to put up beadboard paneling from floor to ceiling? You want to just cover over your drywall altogether and go all carpentry? Yeah, if you do a good job, it'll look fine. Like, I'm not going to argue with it. There's no reason you can't. Uh, back to Sarah, floor leveler mentioned earlier, used on the concrete level of the linoleum. Do I buy a modified or non-modified floor leveler? Thanks. Uh, it doesn't matter. I don't even know if that exists. We're not talking thin set. You're going to be adding like a, a quarter of an inch, right? It's like very, very little. So you don't have no issue. You just got to make sure you put the primer on first. Okay. Pick up the, um, go to the Home Depot, buy the multi-surface bonding primer from Custom Products. It's in the tile department. You can roll that on like a paint on the entire floor because it'll it'll save you the question if the if the if the if the, if the, um, the leveling runs over onto the under the vinyl if it doesn't have a bonding primer it's going to chip off and then when you walk on your floor it'll all break and it'll sound like hell so paint the whole floor you're gonna buy a bucket you got enough for 800 square feet anyway right um, 50 bucks get it done and then and then you're fine and then pour the floor leveler on. It'll be absolutely perfect, and you're going to be just fine. All right, cheers, Sarah. Actually, I just did that in my bathroom, like, uh, three days ago. I'm doing a conversion from a two-piece to a three-piece, so get ready. Part of my church, right? Very exciting. It's coming. I know. I'm getting my occupancy permit. I put in a shower. I had to build a room bigger. I had to add plumbing. I had the same floor issue. We just did painted floor leveler. Done. I met it right at the door with the existing vinyl, okay, and I'm going to cover the whole thing. So I'm going to go floor level right into the hall with new vinyl. It's going to be awesome. Um, how frequently do you hold members chats? We try diligently to do twice a month. A lot of times we only get once a month, but we try. It depends on our traveling and our touring and all this other stuff that we do. But I like to, once a month you can kind of bank on. And twice a month if we have our stuff together. Ah, okay. Boom, 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 boom. How would you waterproof a flanged window on a wall that uses tar paper under the siding? Blue skin on sill and liquid flashing. Anything to watch out for for products? Okay, yeah. I would just put the flange on and then use the blue tuck tape right to the tar paper. And you're going to be fine. That was Ryan at the bottom. Yeah. Am I missing something? No. Matthew. Cheers, buddy. Uh, you got a stinky fresh water from some of your cold faucets. 
change your hot water anode, still smells. Treated it with hydrogen peroxide, went away, then came back. Have a filter, but it still stinks. How to fix. Okay. What's going on here, Matthew, is um, you're trying to solve a problem that has a hundred different variables. So you got to call somebody who can come in there and actually test your water and then actually come up with a solution for your water in your area. And if you call a, a company that does water purification technology, they'll have customers all over your region who have a same similar problem. And they'll say, oh, you live in this neighborhood. Chances are this is your problem. They'll come and test it, confirm it, and they'll put together a project or a system for you that'll work. It's really that simple, right? And they can vary between two and 10,000 bucks, depending on how lousy your water is. But if you really want to solve a problem with water, just, just go right to the guy that does, does all the testing for all the variables and knows the soil and water conditions in your region. And it'll save you years of trying to figure it out by yourself. And in the meantime, while you're trying to figure it out, you've got all this crud running through your water, messing up your plumbing, messing up your faucets, right? And then it's costing you money. So, like, that's the answer. Okay. Uh, we get this 1901 home from uh, yeah. Kopf Jaeger. Kopf Jaeger? Is that what we're going to say? I like that. That's cool. Uh, looking to add on to a 1901 home with a two-story addition. Balloon framing, and I'm not sure how cutting into the existing exterior clapboard sheathing will affect the integrity of the structure. Okay, so you have balloon framing, and you're not sure how cutting into the exterior, like one by eights, let's call it, is going to affect the structure. Um, negatively is the answer. If you want to do an, 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 a two-story addition onto a 1901 home, and you don't have a structural engineer on your Rolodex, on like your speed dial, then, then you are really gambling with your project, okay? Get a structural engineer, let them sort out a process and a, and, 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 a, and, a, and a solution to all of your structural issues because you don't want to mess with that because it is structure. They, they transfer load one, one stud to the next in that balloon frame. You really cannot afford to mess around with that, okay? It's dangerous and it could be life-threatening. So get help. It's a few hundred bucks. Have them come up to the house. And then if you're if you're lucky and he's like, oh, yeah, you won't have any problems. Go ahead and peel it off. Well, then there you go. But uh, you might just as easily find out that you're going to have to spend a thousand or fifteen hundred bucks to get the plans from him because he's he's licensed. He's got the stamp. Right. He can supersede the city engineers and the city permit officers. And as long as you follow what he says, you don't have to listen to what the city says. That's how wonderful these guys are. So just go ahead. Um, building code does not solve problems when you're tying into a 1901 house. Okay. They didn't have a building code until the seventies. So this is not the time to be creative. Um, you want, you want to gamble? World's got lots of casinos. Don't do it in your house where you live. All right. Um, yeah, you can scrap copper for more than the cost of PEX. We're finding pinholes in existing copper lines from the 50s for sure. You know why? Because copper is only designed to last 50 years. Big surprise there. Worth it to replace most of it to PEX now or code nightmare, Pittsburgh? First of all, yeah, get rid of all the copper in your house if you're in a 1950 home. Just update the PEX, period, done, sold. It's not even worth talking about, right? It's like saying... Um, the tires on my car, I can seal, see the steel belt on all of them. Is it time to change the tire? Right? Like, they're always going flat. Is it time to change the tire? Yes. Dear God, what are you waiting for? An accident? Anyway. Um, hey, Jeff, when are you doing more exterior work on the church so I can see when I pass by? <laughs> That's great. I have no idea. I have no plans. I cut the grass. That's about the only thing we're doing right now. That's all interior right now. We're just working on an occupancy permit. Uh, that's fun. We will see what the future holds. Um, and Murph tries. I have an exterior door from a sunroom onto a pack back patio. Door frame is attached to brick with Tapcon screws. Sure. Any advice on how to secure it to the brick? Okay. Uh, no. I have to see the pictures first. Uh, generally, I find expansion foam is really helpful. But if you have 
If the door is already attached to the brick with tap guns, then that should be all you need. I don't understand the problem. Um, generally speaking, if we have a complete masonry product, we'd like to line the masonry with wood and then install the door interior of that. It makes life easier, but we'll see. Where are you going, bud? Um, well, we're at the bottom of the question, so I'm going back. Oh, wait, we're all caught up? A Look at that. Guys, we're all caught up, and there's still 25 minutes left. you got a question, feel free to ask right now. If you're just joining or jumping in, and here we are. Uh, this is for members only. Um, you can watch, but you can't ask questions unless you super chat or become a member. And that's how it works because we answered, I don't know, maybe two, 250 questions tonight. Probably 2,000. Probably 2,000. Yeah. Save the world. <laughs> Ryan wants to know, how would you waterproof a flanged window installed over tar paper? I already hit that one. Oh, yeah? Yeah, yeah I'm all over it. Oh, here we go. They got a new one. And Jay, uh, Jay Flywheel is new to the membership program. Cheers to you, dude. And then Philip is in here with a little bit of love. He's got a question. Is my attached garage is hot? 105 in the evening. Yeah, I bet. It's got drywall, but no insulation except in the walls. Okay, will adding 16 inches in the attic help or just trap in the heat and make it worse for longer? You're in Texas. Okay, great question. It's going to help a lot, all right? But remember that your garage, unless it has a cooling source, if the, if the temperature outside is 105, Long enough, it's going to be 105 inside. But if you insulate it on the walls and the ceiling, then generally speaking, the heat of the day will be separated by the insulation. And you're going to find that it maybe goes to 85 or 90 in the garage. And it's not going to be as extreme. So in the evening, when things cool down a little bit, it'll be a lot more comfortable. And you'll be able to use the space, right? And that's probably the goal. It's like, Mark, Philip, you can't even use your garage in the summertime, right? So you go out there, you might as well crawl into an oven. I get it. Yeah, insulating the ceiling. It's cheap. It's dirty. It's quick. It's easy. Get it done. You're going to love it. All right. Uh, 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 you need a vacation. <laughs> I think a lot of us will be open to a paid-only Super Chat live Q&A. <laughs> yeah. But, well, you know, like, um, I would consider that. But you got to throw your money where your mouth is in order for me to consider it. <laughs> Uh, listen, I mean, if you got a question and, and it's too busy and you can't get an answer, hit the super chat. I remember or not. I mean, I'm doing the best I can, but you guys have a guarantee, right? You can always just go to the forum and I'll answer your question. I'm in there every day. Uh, sometimes I get a couple days behind because it's just overwhelming, but you know, usually I'm pretty good at it. So you're doing great. You're damn right. I am. I rock. All right. Wendy wants to know. Is PEX pipe required now when replumbing an 18, I'm sorry, an 80s house from copper, or can we use the PVC? Okay, there's no requirement to use PEX. You have the option to use copper or CPVC or PEX in a house. All three systems are currently acceptable. Um, what I'm going to say is an 80s house is not that old. you got to update all your systems yet. Okay, it's not necessary. But if you're doing a major renovation, you're opening walls, you have access to it, and you're 40 years in, it's a great time to consider making that change because you're probably going to be in a place in the next 20 years where it needs to be done. So, yeah, um, I love PEX because you can run it continuous with no joints, no risk of leaks. And you can run it right from the basement right to the fixture. Okay, one solid pack, no joints, and that can be done. All right, um... Okay, Richard, we have a new home and have flat paint. What prep to paint over with semi-gloss? Uh, zero, just paint. Unless it's black, then you're going to need a gray primer. Uh, flat paint accepts semi-gloss, no problem at all. So, um, you know, I, I was generally speaking, I like to give it a quick sand just to take care of all the dirt that's laying on there. All right, but uh, that's about all you need. From flat to semi, it makes no difference. Okay, <clears throat> How difficult is it to replace the main joist under a load-bearing wall? Um, it's not that difficult. It's it's a little labor-intensive because you've got to bring stru temporary structural support to the to the load that it's carrying, and then you replace the joist, right? So you got to build basically two walls and then replace the joist. Um, if you, if you're not sure what to do, uh, again get a structural engineer. He can come up with a plan for you, right? It's the same thing every time. 
Structure means engineer. <clears throat> um, in California, and you're stuck in a small kitchen remodel for over a year. Found this kitchen is miswired. Undersized wire, etc. License poor does not seem to be of much help. 60K in. What now? You're in California and you're stuck in a kitchen remodel and you're having problems with your, your licensing board. Wow. Sometimes the best way to move forward is move backward, right? Like, don't try to keep making things work moving forward. If your electrical is screwed up, start over. Right? Like, go right back to the panel and just run a new circuit. Sometimes when you're in renovation, we, we have a tendency to want to say, all right, I have a problem. How do I fix it by moving forward instead of backwards? In a lot of cases, you got to separate remodeling from renovation. And don't assume it's a remodel if you're touching your mechanical systems. As soon as you are, you're in renovation mode. That means open the bloody wall and change it out and make it brand new. Bring it up to code and you won't have issues with the code people. It's really hard to say, well, we're grandfathering in an old system in a new renovation. They don't like that language. If you had access to open up the wall, you should have, you could have. They're just going to make you do it. There's no winning that fight. The only other option is you could have sold your house as is last year, but now it's too late because now the housing market has changed. So go backwards and stop trying to go forward. And it might be painful, might hurt. You might have to take cabinets off and stuff. Oh, well, right? At least once you go back to the beginning and you change things and you update it, then you can move forward and you're moving forward for the rest of the rest of the project. I would talk to my licensing people and say, what exactly do you want to see here? And then give it to them. Because right now, you're in contention with them and they're not your friend. So become their friend again. Okay? That's the best advice I can give you. Um, Les has got a 1910 house in Kansas. Settled bad. Yeah, it happens. And now have cracks in plaster. Is there an easier way to fix this than remove all and drywall it all? Do you have good recommendations? Here's the thing, Les. 1910, we didn't have a building code. Um, we didn't have knowledge on soil conditions, underpinning proper footings. So your house has moved and it's got some cracks and you want to fix it, chisel out your plaster, make a V-notch and add new plaster or oil prime it and then add uh, a drywall compound, put on some paper tape and resurface, resurface your walls. Uh, if everything is finished settling, you won't have any new cracks and you can you can actually repair it all that way. But the way you transition from plaster to new drywall and new paint is with an oil-based paint primer, okay? And that barrier bonds the old and new technology together. And so you can repair anything doing that. Okay. Uh, how do I know if I should use backer rod on my driveway and seal it? If you have a big gap, use backer rod and you won't have to use hardly any caulking to seal it. All right, it'll, it'll, it'll provide um, backing, which is what it does. It fills the hole for you. And that's all there is to it. And they come in a variety of sizes. So if you got a hole, stuff it full of backing rod and then cock it up and it'll buy you some time. Um, Yinzer, after fixing any mortar in a stone foundation, is there a parging paint you recommend over the top? <sighs> Already mitigating the water outside, but there's old white parging on it. Dry lock? Question mark. Okay, people. The amount of times I get asked about dry lock. It is not a miracle cure. It was probably a, a, a like two o'clock in the morning commercial. I don't know anything about dry lock except for the fact that it doesn't actually work over long terms. It's not a solution. It's a temporary fix. It's a Band-Aid in a shower. It's going to fall off. Okay. It just, it's temporary. You're talking about your foundation. You're not looking for a temporary fix. Parging over any mortar in a stone foundation, you want to go with a non-modified finish, period. You need moisture to move because it's moving. Stone foundations have moisture moving through it. So whatever you finish with has to allow moisture to move through it. Dry lock will block the moisture and all that moisture is going to go inside your house and you're going to mold it. Okay? So don't seal up your foundation. Let it breathe. 
All right. Yeah, right? Okay, we got 15 minutes left. We are moving on to rapid fire. Ask me a quick question. I'll give you a quick answer. Yes, no, maybe so. Um, the evil milkshake wants to know if a kitchen vent hood installation should it go 90 degrees or have bends to address crease? I have options, but 90 degrees will be 16 feet to the roof. Wow. Okay. Um, your your new kitchen vent hood should already have a system to trap the grease before it gets to that ducting. Okay. So this is this is an old school thinking about grease in the duct. We don't get grease in the duct in a residential kitchen unless you are cooking up a deep frying machine, right? You you have a grease trap in your hood fan. Change it, clean it, maintain it, and you, the grease will not migrate into your ducting. And at the same time, yes, everything that goes up in that duct, you want to make sure that it has a way to exit right back to the vent. All right? So it goes up. If you want to go out, it goes out. But don't have it go up and then dip somewhere. Don't have it like a semi-P trap where it can fill full of grease because that is a fire waiting to happen. Um, if you're going 16 feet to the roof, then it doesn't matter. You're going straight up. And what goes up goes down, so don't worry about it. Um, Jason says he has an existing deck. If I add a pergola, can I attach it to the deck or do I need to pour in foundation? Great question, right? Um, depends where you live, to be honest with you, because every, every region has different rules about decks. So if you're going to add a pergola to an existing deck and the deck is in concrete blocks, then your pergola, generally speaking, needs to be attached to that deck with screws. And just set it on it, right? But you don't have to put its own foundation. Generally speaking, you can put a pergola on top of a wooden deck, and the deck boards themselves should be designed to transfer load. I like to say, try to keep the feet of the pergola within six inches of where there's an actual floor joist. All right? Do the best you can. But in most homes, when we're dealing with structural load, if a structural load wall was within 12 inches of a joist and they run parallel, the structural engineers allow to say that's that's close enough that it'll transfer. So load 12 inches to joist in a house, snow load. You're just a pergola. So even if your pergola position, you got two joists and your pergola's in the middle, it's a 16 inch cavity. It means worst case, you're eight inches from each. So you're gonna be just fine, all right? Don't sweat it, screw it down and move on with your life. Um, <clears throat> okay, motivation and drive. Cheers, welcome to Money in the Bank. Jason Prayer is in Ontario. That's good to know. Uh, Scott Shelby wants to know, a uh, tan aluminum siding house. What color should I repaint my front door? Reds and browns work great, and red is a great front door color. Next. Yinzer says, old box gutters leaking, rotting out the soffit. Mm-hmm. Same 150-year-old Pittsburgh house, but the gutters are probably 50 to 60s. Worth it to try to reseal or just pull off, start modern 28-foot roof. If your soffit is rotting... You're screwed. You can't fix that. You got to change your soffit. Sorry. There's just, don't bother trying. Once the soffit starts to rot, that means there's so much moisture in there. Yeah. 150 year old house with rotten soffit. You're going to find that the wood in the roof within six inches of that soffit is also rotten. There's nothing left to attach anything to. Sooner or later, you're going to have to take that off, laminate some new two by threes in your roof cavity and put a new soffit on and then reattach your, your gutters. All right. Um, <clears throat> if it isn't falling off, you don't have to fix it till it does, but it's going to happen <laughs> at some point. So save your pennies in the meantime and be ready for it. Uh, it's a DIY project to do all of that work right up to the gutters. So at least that's good. Right. Carl, is it difficult to add an extension with a window to my roof? Okay. Like a dormer. There was one previously there, but when the roof was repaired before we bought it, it was taken down. Is it difficult to add a dormer? No. Um, basically, what you have is you have, you have a, a, an angled roof joist or truss. And what you're going to do is you're going to cut a great big square in it. And you're going to cut out part of a joist. And then you're going to reframe with doubles, top and bottom. Okay. And you're going to transfer the load to the other ones. That's all it really is. And then you can throw in a doghouse dormer if you want to. Uh, structurally, it's not that tricky. But... <clears throat> Here I go again, giving you structural advice. Get an engineer, for God's sake. Ain't going to hurt you. Um, 
Okay. Uh, and then thanks. We're up to date. We're done. Well, if none of you care, and I'm all done and answered all your questions, cheers. It's been lovely hanging out. It's 10 to 7. I started work this morning at 6, so I think I'm, I deserve a right to go home early. All right. Cheers. Thanks a lot for coming out. Hopefully that helps, and we will do this again really, really soon. And uh, don't forget, what's the video on Saturday, Eric? Where are we here now? Oh, we're doing all the plumbing, right? The sink and the faucet. Sink, faucet, drain. Right, there we go. So we're connecting all the plumbing on the church there on Saturday. Make sure you're around to check that out. Video's up at noon. Yeah, set your clocks. Cancel all your plans in the middle of a Saturday. <laughs> uh, oh, hang on. Um, motivation. motivation. They just joined. They just okay. joined. You got a house built in the 2000s after ripping out the carpet. The treads are not to new IRC code of 10 inch. Do I need to cut new stringers? No. Okay. All of the framing, including the stairs that are built in your house, are grandfathered in. You don't have to modify your home every time the code changes. Unless you're modifying the stairs themselves. Finishing the carpet or whatever you're putting on that stairs doesn't require you to change the structure of the stairs. Only if you're changing the structure do you have to bring it up to new code. All right, so you are good to go. Don't be sweating it. All right. Well, thanks everybody. It's been awesome. Good to see you all in the chat again. Uh, it's nice to know that we're not out here all alone in this great big wide world. Uh, have fun. Don't forget, every hour you spend fixing up your house is money in the bank. Cheers to next time.